Hello everybody, my name is Sam Kenyon, I am the author of I Am Not Raymond Wallace and I'm thrilled today as part of the virtual book tour to welcome Erica Wyman, Acting Artistic Director of the Royal Shakespeare Company no less, my great friend, great collaborator, uh, to talk about my book and the writing process amongst other things. Hello Erica. Hello Sam. <laughs> what a lovely pleasure and privilege to be here talking with you about your brilliant book. You've read it recently. I know. Yeah, I have. I have. Um, I inhaled it. I think I said to you that I, um, I had it by my bed for a few weeks, feeling a bit guilty. I was sort of reading a page or two. I, went, I, don't, I don't want to read a page or two. And I couldn't remember why. But having had a bit of prior with your book in a much, much earlier draft, I then had a long plane journey and I, I, I sort of drank it like it was a shot glass. I just, I just read it all, all, inhaled it. And I loved it. I was very proud of you. Thank you. I'm thrilled. And yes, so Erica read uh, a version of this from some 20 years ago. Um, I'd like, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your reflection. I know you've got some questions for me as well about um, what that was like to come back to it mm. and what's come up for you um, as a result of coming back to it. Yeah, I mean, it feels like genuinely a kind of something that doesn't happen to you very often is that you get a kind of glimpse by by the things that are familiar in the book of what you and I were like 20 years ago. Um, not, not in um, a sort of portrait, of course, but just in, a, just in a sort of sense of our emotional lives and what we were grappling with and what you were grappling with, of course, in particular. But I, yeah, it reminded me. So it was like a great uh, inhalation of memory. My overarching feeling was that the beginning of the book felt exactly the same. <laughs> And I know that it isn't, but it felt exactly the same, the same sense of being sort of plunged in this wonderful way into a world of discovery, I suppose, that sense of discovery. So you're discovering it along with Raymond and you're, and you're living every sort of heartbeat of it. I and mean, it just feels so on his skin, in every sense on his skin, that there's the, the experience of being in New York, but then of course, what he discovers about himself and falling in love and falling, and falling in lust and all everything that it means felt exactly the same felt like this sort of exhilarating everything I'd remembered about it and loved about it I suppose I was more alert and I don't know if this is about me or you or the book but I was more alert to the clues as to where it would go than I remember being I remember being more easily fooled by it maybe 20 years ago <laughs> as to where it might go and um this is a very obvious thing for me to say because of the day job I do, but the the very, very opening page now to me feels like the prologue of Romeo and Juliet. You know, it just, it does a really daring thing. It says this is all going to end very badly. <laughs> but never mind that, let's do it anyway. And I, I, I loved that, it felt really exciting to me. Um, and forgive me, it may always have been there, but that felt, that, that it felt sharper, that's the, courage about but then as the book as the story unravels as things start to go wrong um as he has to or chooses to go home from new york i suppose i felt pretty consistently from there to the end of the book that this um the deep sadness of it felt to me really um fulfilling and I think when I read it 20 years ago it felt frightening the, the 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 sense the sense of the tragedy of it felt frightening felt like this is it's um, it was unbearable that someone could could be so close to happiness and be prevented from finding that happiness whereas now and again I don't know how much this is about me because every good book does that, doesn't it? But th there's something in how, how tragic Raymond's story is that is a lesson in, in, how to, in how to be and how to be for one another. And I found, um, I found the ending actually incredibly uplifting. I was really not expecting it. I was really not expecting it. I mean, really till quite close to the end, um, when Roman's son meets Joey, I, I, I sort of didn't want them to meet because it felt like the I felt like it was going to be the completion of that tragedy that they neither of them had 
him in their life. And actually, I felt quite, quite different about it. It felt really, um, you know, with no sentimentality about what had happened, but that both of them had the tools to live well. And well, it was that's amazing. <laughs> that was gorgeous. <laughs> Well, well, it's wonderful. No, I, I, um, I, there's so much in what you've said. Thank you so much. It's an amazing um, analysis and, and, and really unique um, in terms of a perspective on these two texts. You know, the, there's the one somewhere down here, which is the, the original. Um, you're not misremembering. I, I, I had a thing years ago, and, and it's a funny thing, and I don't, you might find this in me as a friend as well, where I, I had almost a fetish to hide and to be discovered, like a desire that somebody could, um, I know that you're a, a, a big fan of crime fiction, that somebody could sort of unlock the secrets somehow. And I think in that early iteration, what I was really doing was wanting to um, make it <laughs> in the most annoying way, quite difficult to get into what was going on actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so the beginning is probably the same. There, there, there wasn't the opening paragraph. There wasn't that sense that as you say about Romeo and Juliet, it's all going to end badly, but let's just give it a whirl and see what happens, see what we find out along the way. That wasn't there. There was the same sort of narrative. There was the same excitement, as you say, about New York. But no, there wasn't that deliberate um, help and holding hand of the reader that I've put into this new one. And what's brilliant about you bringing that up is there was a bit of a tussle between Nathan and Justin, my editor and publisher, about that moment. Because early on, for example, and this is not a spoiler, it says uh, that we, we know we're reading a book within a book from the very first page. Um, but there was a version where we didn't know we were reading a book within a book because we hadn't done it typographically like that. And Nathan agreed with it, my editor, and Justin went, this is going to wreck it. Why are you doing this? Why are you making it so hard for everybody? And then I suddenly went, oh, hang on a minute. What if I make it overt that we are reading a book called, as we know here, uh, Manhattan and Other Regrets by Raymond Wallace from the very beginning. And then, lo and behold, we're then reading Manhattan 1963. So we know we're in it. So that was very conscious about um, going through yeah. that and taking us through that very safely. And, and then what's interesting was I had many, many more moments in the first section where I reminded us that we were being told a story that I actually, having made that typographic decision at the beginning of the book, could then remove. Because then if you forget it, great, but you can't say you weren't warned. Yeah, and you do, you willfully forget it, I think, because you also, I mean, very much like a great thriller or a or detective fiction, you you don't want to know how it how it unravels. And so, and you hope that it might not, which is ridiculous, but you do. It's exactly like with Romeo and Juliet. Otherwise, we wouldn't want them to fall in love, would we? <laughs> so we, 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 willfully, we willfully forget. Yeah, we let it go. And then and then I suppose it's very interesting. I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, so many things have happened in our lives in these last 20 years. We have both lost a parent and we both become a parent. Yeah. And so which is so um, in, in very different ways and in very different circumstances that I think when you talk about it being frightening, I think <laughs> I think in many ways the complexities of being gay in a in a homophobic environment to whatever degree and uh, from, from whatever period of one's life um, is terrifying, actually. Yeah. And uh, the future is terrifying. Um, walking outside um, in a certain outfit can be terrifying. There's all this, we yeah. know this for, uh, across genders, across sexualities. Um, and I think what uh, I am writing from a period in my life that I always dreamed of, and therefore with perhaps a greater understanding of um, the avenues I might have taken for a less happy life. And uh, and therefore with these characters, because of what I then uh, allowed myself to do with the story, and you're right, the second and third parts take us into a different section, to go, um, who are the different us's around the world? Isn't it funny how some people roll with things in a way that other people roll under things and um what, what the, 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 these characters offer us different opportunities and also that there are always people around us uh, you're one of my people um who who are there as as allies and friends in those circumstances who go um, do you want to have a rethink about that one or you've always got this option you know that so 
I suppose looking broadly at a, a you know, as now I'm approaching 50, that yes, as a 29 year old, I had a very different perspective on life and what the future might hold. And now I'm the age many of the characters are uh, towards the end of the book. And that's or I've passed that at those ages. So actually, um, that's very nourishing to be able to go, oh, here are some options. But there's some, in what you say, there's a, it, both in the friendship you talk about, which I feel very strongly in our friendship, is it, one of the responsibilities is to give, give one another courage. And that, that is, for me, is the, again, not wanting to spoil it, but the heart of the tragedy is that there's a moment of decision in, in which Raymond is alone. And there isn't, I mean, there are lots of, there are lots of, potential people but he doesn't he doesn't enable them to have that space to give him courage um and that i suppose it seems or for me it seemed when we were that age that you had to figure out how to do it yourself and you know speaking as a straight woman who in my 20s was re you know i was really kind of actively uh championing campaigning for equity for my gay friends I think I'd entirely missed and maybe it was a good thing that I had but entirely missed that the courage required to be yourself in a world that is hostile to you is actually what we've all got to do and I don't want to reduce it by saying that but I found in you know reading the book now that that's what I mean by the kind of lesson of it that yeah it requires it requires the courage to say you don't, you can't make big decisions and shouldn't make big decisions by yourself. <laughs> you should allow people in because you, your own version of you is, is, is always going to be limited, I suppose. I, I, yeah. Well, there's a thing about regrets as well here. And one of the things, and I don't know if it's a, if it's a cliche, I don't know if I've made it up or if I've just invented it, but anyway, my, my theory about regrets is that they're lessons we're not yet prepared to learn. So, um, <laughs> I deliberately chose the word regrets for Raymond's book because I think he's not prepared to learn them. And yeah. yet I also want to encourage, and this is a, in a broader sense, um, um, about the, the way the, the, the fuller story, not just his book goes, is about having compassion for our earlier decisions. Yes, yes, yes. And really going, uh, okay, I understand the circumstances in which I made those sets of decisions. I am ready to learn the lessons from those sets of decisions. Yeah, uh, yeah. How does that might be? Do you see what I mean? And then go, and sometimes on behalf of other people whose decisions we're ricocheting from. Yeah, yeah. To, to think... really accept them, to really, yeah, they are who you are. And, they're, you know, they're, they're to be loved like all the other bits. Yeah. But to, Sam, tell me about New York, because I was struck, probably I was struck the first time actually, but I was very struck this time by how New York is a, for me, is a character in the book. And I say it now because that point about um, forgiving yourself or, or coming to terms with decisions seems to me in the book, you use New York as a way of being other than other than oneself. Raymond uses it as a way of being other than himself and therefore leaving New York or not leaving New York is all connected to whether he is prepared to be, to be himself or to be kind to himself. And I, I wonder how that relates to your relationship to that city or, or, and indeed Paris is very important late in the book. I'm spoiling it, but only in a nice way yep, to look sorry. forward, that to look forward to. <laughs> the, um... I've always, it's actually both both coasts of America have always, uh, as a gay man, I felt incredibly embraced. I've, I've, I felt terribly attractive when I'm there. And I felt very, um, not so much lusted after, but, but, but um, treated as though I'm, I'm special. And there's something, and I did, I did want to convey that sense of um, delight and freedom that I think, and it's funny, going, it might be that that I'd be more likely to go, I remember coming back from, um, and my cousin used to live in San Francisco, and I came back from a holiday 20 years ago, and thought, 
how can I be in London the person I feel I am in San Francisco? And one of the things I did then was to look up a gay writing group and I googled gay London writing and found a group called Gay London Writers who are in the acknowledgements at the end of this book. And I then began to go to a sort of salon with the early iterations of Raymond Wallace. So there are kind of there are transferable skills in my experience from that sort of traveling. Um, New York, I, I, remember, I remember going to see my friend Eliza who's on a Broadway show and she was working in the evening and I was just wandering around going to get some groceries and I went into a grocery store uh, in the village and um, I saw these three guys in there and we smiled at each other and we clearly established that we were gay and then we let, bought our groceries and then we went out when we found ourselves outside and we got chatting and they said what are you doing and I said well I've just got these groceries and um, and I said what are you doing and they said we're going to go to a club in the East Village do you want to come and I said yeah I dropped, dropped these off and these complete strangers, and I look back now with sort of terror as I tell the story, but I got into a car with three complete strangers. They took me to a club. We danced. They then brought me home, dropped me off at the apartment. And so there's that kind of exuberant camaraderie that can come from my experience in your night. I sort of probably should never go back again in case it doesn't happen. But I've just had this most extraordinary times where where people go, you seem lovely. Should we just be lovely together? And there was, and what's what's particularly special about that is that there was no sex in that so it wasn't the usual transaction yeah. for queerness or gay for gay men it was just a we're part of a community how can we give you a nice time and how can we make sure you get home safe <laughs> so yes there is that for me about new york and it's very it's very it, there is something uh, as we, we worked uh, for those of you who don't know erica and i worked on a show miss littlewood which we might talk about in a minute um and as part of that, I contacted people in New York who might have known Joan, including Hal Prince, who mm -hmm. said, sure, come to my the 16th floor of the Rockefeller Center and, and welcomed me. And this idea, there is something about um, um, being able to transcend who one is in America, I think, in some ways, or in America, as was perhaps, um, that is different from our, my experience in, in the UK. Yeah, I sort of hear something unfiltered as well there's a directness that you know I know I know suits you but also perhaps suits the situation you're writing about of of taking taking away a combination of excuses and barriers and obstacles and there's there's, just, there's a straightforwardness um which is very I think it's very clear in the book that including characters that are not intimately involved with Raymond there's a straightforwardness that he finds really appealing and interesting and wakes wakes him up in a way yeah that's really interesting and then um just going back to the conversation we were having about 20 years <laughs> and what's changed and the fact that we're both parents now i it's another answer to your question really i was struck by how compassionate you are in the book towards at least two parents and I thought that felt really different. And again, that might be me, but I wondered how you reacted to that because it would be easy, I think, to write this story. And I suspect you never did actually, but it would be easy to write this story in a way that really judges um, both of those parents in two different families. And I, I felt that you, on the one hand gave an amazing it's an amazing portrait I'm trying really hard not to spoil it but it's an amazing portrait of a father and a father's uh, flexibility of thought and flexibility of emotion so it's a, be it's a beautiful thing that I feel is quite rare to me that sort of actually wholly positive but fully drawn and detailed and complex but wholly positive experience of a parent and then quite a difficult portrait of a, of a or a portrait of rather a difficult mother but it nonetheless has compassion in it because her loss and her pain is real too and is 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 activating all the choices she makes or unconscious choices she makes anyway what do you think about all that I think um I've had 20 years of therapy since I wrote that first draft and um part of that is accepting circumstances that were in place years ago and rather than trying to wish that they hadn't happened, accepting that they did happen and that um, there are repercussions because of that, but there's also, depending on the personalities involved, um, the potential to heal, yeah. which is which I couldn't have known at that stage of my life. 
and which yeah. I definitely know now. So there's that. There's also um, I've experienced at times um, uh, when when friends, gay friends who've said, oh, my parents were really cool about it. And my mum used to drop me off at gay clubs when I was 15. And, and I'm like, oh, did they really? Um, <laughs> whereas um, and so what what that used to provoke in me was a kind of envy, both of that person and a kind of um, beating up of myself somehow. Mm. And and mm. what I wanted very clearly to portray is just the different experiences that we have as queer people and how we can't say that they, you know, some people are in, that's one of the themes of the book really is about this idea that there are people who just go, right, I don't care what you're going to do to me. I'm going to do this and I'm going to be this. And then there are those people who go, this really affects me what you do to me. And I'm going to try and navigate that with me, who I am. And then there are people who are absolutely cowed by it and destroyed. Yeah. And, yes. and, I, and I want to, to just, I, I don't really see that disgust really as, as the various ways in which we respond to the circumstances in which we have found ourselves. So, um, and, and possibly as a way of talking about how we might um, repair or or individuate ourselves from something that might be toxic or um, approach something later on and go, can we have another go at this, given what we all know now? Uh, and so the idea that um, some of the characters might meet again was very, very important to me in this version. Yes. That would be the possibility of some some sort of um meeting let's not discuss what happens in that meeting but just some way in which they go there is enough goodwill yes so what might be made of this and then the other thing is that we've we've had lots and lots of discussions like this which where people go say things like oh but of course it was different then <laughs> and you go not for women it wasn't not for people of color it wasn't not for gay people it wasn't so there were but in those moments there are always stories about the people who like this friend whose mother took out this imaginary friend whose mother took him to um gay bars there are always um really surprising allies along the way and enablers and i find that very very exciting and i suppose I suppose I wanted to do a bit of a shout out to those secret heroes in our lives who have, you know, who've just gone, don't listen to the bastards. Come on, you can do this. And I'll take you or I'll protect you or come around when you're feeling like that or whatever version of events that is. So that's, yeah. Yeah, and what I think is delightful, which I think speaks to your point about, um, we've got stereotypes within stereotypes that, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to battle this kind of behavior or you're supposed to, ignore this kind of behavior it's also true in the allies you write that they're all different and um which is dark isn't it because of course all people are different but it's quite rare it feels quite rare to me and that there's um i don't think it spells anything to to, to say the name dolores who i adore because her she has fun with the idea of being an ally to to raymond and that feels really joyful the idea that actually there's fun to be had in 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 standing next to somebody who could do with a bit more space being made for them in the world Th that's that's much more fun than than say conforming <laughs> much more fun much more fun <laughs> and that celebration i mean it's interesting you mentioned dolores i i was also very very clear so so 20 years ago this was a story of of, of a couple of pair of young men who meet um amongst other men within that but um uh you're a great you're a great example of this that, that that it's not just about men and that that i wanted to have this this raft of fabulous female characters as well who um are uh, th th we've got to focus on this storyline fine but but absolutely people supported championed uh, ma made to laugh by all these um, you know hugged by whatever these uh, these people are these women specifically um because that's my experience of life and that's what's got me through it <laughs> <laughs> um I had a question for you, which is a question really about, um, and I'm struck as I hold these two things up side by side, what a similar um, approach, and they're completely different designers, of course, but I wondered what um, it was like, um, if this isn't too weird a question, reading something that I'd written as prose and then having worked so in such a detailed way on my lyrics and script and whether there were any things that struck you about my writing as a broader thing. Yeah, I mean they are they are 
hugely different pieces of work in, in superficial senses. Um, but I suppose the obvious thing to say is you've got an outrageously good turn of phrase, and that's true in both pieces of work. You know, and I, as you know, I don't have your capacity for recall or I'd quote it, but, but, but the sense in which you take, you often take, which I think you do very brilliantly in the as well, you take a phrase that we think we are familiar with and then just twist it. And so that, so then it, it hooks and it does something in your brain. I think, you know, that is, that's the great lyricist in you. And it's written, it's throughout Raymond, I think, that sense of uh, playing with language. And I suppose that's, that's another connection in a slightly different way that seems to me in Raymond, you're also playing with the idea that language is 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 weaponry is uh, armory in some way is a way is a way to be because you can be it through your writing and it's that's interesting because that you know Joan wasn't a writer in that way in fact Joan's writing she wrote a lot and it's as you know very well utterly bonkers and almost impossible to follow so she and she has a she has a killing turn of phrase but she doesn't she didn't shape, it seems to me, she didn't shape her own identity through writing. She shaped it through making theatre with others. But she did understand, and Miss Littlewood really goes there, that you can change the world by getting the narrative right. You can shift the world on its axis by if you get the narrative right. So that those feel similar, you know, in the, in the two pieces of work. And I suppose the other thing is that Miss Littlewood appears to be a biography of Joan and a story of the theatre and, a, and, a, and it is a love letter to the theatre and it requires unbelievable skill from everybody involved in order to turn our hands to all the different kinds of theatricals that she was excited by. But in the end, it's a story of a, a love that is lost. And um, that, that just sings out very strongly to me, having spent so much time with Miss Littlewood, that there's this, you are just, you're very curious about and you're very eloquent about the sense in which a lost love tells you something about yourself and about what you, how to be whole. There's something, there's some connection for me about how lost love can speak very loudly of a loss of part of yourself. I think that's true of Joan and it's true. It's true of Raymond, if I'm not giving too much away. Well, I think that's right. And I suppose what, I, what I'm what i seeing there in that is that actually, if you deny that lost love, then you aren't whole. But there's a, there's a way of holding loss in a productive way to be, um, to become whole or more whole, yeah, feel more whole. And um, maybe, maybe for me, there's also a connection with the kind of drive. I mean, I know it's in a slightly different order for Raymond, but with Joan, it's very clear that her motor is, uh, in your version of her life, her motor is the loss of her father and the sort of double, triple loss that um, he's not around, but also he doesn't seem to care in the way that she might hope. Mm -hmm. So, and then some sense of her own identity, she talks in the, in the early part of the play about how she looks and does she look like him and so that there's a loss of her in not having him around. So that, so there's something going on there, which I haven't quite got to the bottom of, as you can well, tell. tell you what is amazing. On there. <laughs> as I approach my 50th, but I now, I, I saw a photo in my um, photo album recently. My father died five years ago, for those of you who don't know. And I saw a photo in my photo album and I, and I, recently, and I thought, why is, why is dad in there in a recent photo? And it wasn't dad, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think there is an element of what that what's it, what's inherited that we um, you know become and find in ourselves. Um, Erica, you've been an absolute diamond. Um, for, I know you've got to go in a second, but this has been absolutely wonderful. I just wanted to just ask very quickly: you're doing something rather interesting um, coming up next at the RSC, aren't you? Well, well, I'm glad you think so. It's um, it is a literary project. Yes, I am very delighted to be directing an adaptation of Maggie O'Farrell's brilliant novel Hamlet. It's been adapted by Lolita Chakrabarti and we are going to do um, the world premiere of the adaptation in the Swan Theatre here in Stratford-upon-Avon opening at the very beginning of April 2023. So just working on 
How You Turn, the most extraordinary and extravagant novel about grief. Um, I mean, about many things, but also about grief. Um, yeah, into a stage play, but we're, we're, we're nearly there. Yeah, going to rehearsals in the new Good luck, I can't wait. <laughs> Erica, thanks. It's been a complete pleasure. Thanks for giving me your, us your time. And um, everybody, yes, Hamnet, RSC next year. Um, I'm not Raymond Wallace, available in all good book bookstores now. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.